Honest, real, raw, true conversation and prayer with God. You go down into the water, and when you do, the old person dies. You come up out of the water as a new creation of Jesus Christ. Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Now is a great time to grab your weeklies and head to your seats if you haven't already because the service starts in 90 seconds. I'm here to tell you today that God wants to set you free. Oh, yeah. He wants to set you free. relationship with him grow in your walk with him get closer to him spend more time with him because he's better if you want your life to get better then get around the one who is better get around Jesus get around the one who has power to change and transform your life get around the one who has the perfect grace for you and the perfect love for you and the perfect joy for your soul listen he is better Thank you 
so much for spending your time with us today. We're so excited about today's service. We believe this could be the best and most impacting hour of your week. Throughout the service, you may have some questions, comments, prayer requests. So go to churchexperience.tv slash connect or pull out your camera app and hit up our QR code to connect with us. Or you know what, better yet, if you always want to know what's going on here at CE, just hit that subscribe button right here. We would love to hear from you, get back to you and be praying for you. We're ready to dive in. So would you stand with me as we sing some songs of worship to Jesus?
Heavenly Father, I pray to you today, asking, Lord, that those who do not know you will come to know you as their Lord Almighty. God, you reign over all things. Your love is endless. Father, and I just pray that those who don't know your love will feel your love. God, thank you for what you've given us. Thank you for what you do for us and for who you are. And it's in your heavenly name we pray, Jesus. Amen. up our series called Better Decisions and Fewer Regrets. The whole purpose behind this series is to, to help us as we're facing decisions every day that will have consequences for our lives, not only that day, but, but days down the road all the way into an eternity. And because those decisions have such consequences in our lives, it's important for us to make better decisions today, isn't it? So that's why we are, are doing this series with you, and in this series, the first week, we looked at the life of Daniel. We looked at that very hard decision that Daniel had to make. He had to decide, am I going to honor the king and dishonor God, or am I going to honor God and dishonor the king? Oh yeah, if I dishonor the king, they're going to throw me into a den of hungry lions. Well, he made the best decision, and because he made the best decision, God protected him from the lions, and Daniel had no regrets because of his decision. The next week, we looked at Matthew chapter 5, and we learned that it is not good to make decisions when you're angry, right? Uh, we, we realize that, that decisions that are made rash uh, in a rash way deal with our emotions and our anger. They always lead to big regrets in our lives, so we learn not to make decisions you know, rashly, out of anger or emotion, but to, to think them over, to, to make them peacefully in our lives. Last week, then we looked at the decision that Naaman was facing. He had to decide who it was he was going to listen to when he had to decide what decision he was going to make to deal with the leprosy that he had in his life. He could listen to himself, he could listen to the people that cared about him, or he could listen to God. And as he decided who to listen to and to get good information from, he learned to make better decisions and have fewer regrets, and he was cured from his leprosy. Now this morning, we're going to look at a story about a guy that we call the rich young ruler. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 18. The story is also recorded in the book of Mark and the book of Matthew, and uh, has some various different information in each one of them. So you may, during the week, want to go and read these stories in Matthew and, and Mark just to make sure that you've got the whole story in front of you. But in this story, we're going to find one of the best questions that's ever asked in the Bible. And that question is this. How do we get eternal life? How do we get eternal life? You see, that's the question that this rich young ruler was going to ask of Jesus. We pick the story up in Luke chapter 18, verse 18, and it says, While Jesus was teaching about the kingdom of God and the requirement for entrance into the kingdom of God, a ruler asks him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Luke noted that this man was a ruler, Commentators are kind of divided over what kind of ruler he might have been. Some think maybe he was a ruler in the synagogue, a religious type of ruler. Other people think that maybe he was a ruler in the civil sphere. And although scripture doesn't talk about it, so it really isn't that important what kind of ruler he was, we do know that he was a man of influence. He was a man with authority, a man of position. 
we also know from, from this particular passage that he was extremely rich. It tells us that in verse 23. And the Matthew Gospel tells us that he was very young. So because of that, he's often called the rich, young ruler. Now, I want you to notice two things about this question that the rich, young ruler asked Jesus. The first thing I want you to notice is he went to the right person. Everyone has questions about eternal life. But far too often people are going to the wrong source or the wrong person to find their answer. But not this ruler. He went to Jesus. He went to the source of all truth to get the answer to that very important question. The second thing we notice about this question is he asked the right question. He asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the greatest questions in all the Bible. Is there anything more important than knowing how to receive eternal life? Well, the ruler's question concerning the requirement for eternal life reveals to us that this rich young ruler had this spiritual hunger in him. He had this hole that needed to be filled and could only be filled with the spiritual things uh, that he was looking for, that he wasn't satisfied by his wealth. He wasn't satisfied by his influence or his authority or his position. There was still something missing there, so he goes and he asks this question. And maybe you are like this rich young ruler where you have spiritual hunger in your soul. You're not satisfied with what you have, and you want to know what the requirement is for you to have eternal life. So who are you going to go to to help you find the answer to that question? The rich young ruler went to Jesus. He asked him, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Well, here's the response of Jesus to him. Jesus first challenges the ruler's address to him. If you remember, when he addressed him, he said, good teacher. So in verse 19, Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You see, the ruler wanted to honor Jesus. He, he wasn't trying to, to disrespect him. He's trying to give him respect. Good teacher, you know, what do I do? So why would Jesus react this way to this man? It surely isn't because Jesus is not good. It's because he knows this man very well. He knows that this ruler had a defective understanding of what goodness really is. We're going to see here shortly that the ruler thought he was good. And Jesus needed him to see that, that no one is good in comparison to God. So the ruler was making a mistake that many of us make commonly today, and that's to, to compare ourselves to, to other people. Well, compared to that person, I'm a saint, right? However, the ultimate comparison is not with each other, but it's to God, and, and no one is truly good when compared to God. So Jesus' response was to, to him, uh, all right, you asked the question, what do you do to have eternal life? Here's what you can do. You know the commandments. You know, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Jesus lists five of the Ten Commandments. They came from the second tablet, the one that dealt with how we deal with other people. And it's kind of surprising to me that Jesus responded this way to him because earlier he had taught that, that interest into the kingdom of God is really by humble dependence upon the grace of God. But here it seems he's suggesting that you enter the kingdom of God by obeying the commandments. So when he is asked, how do you uh, have eternal life? His answer is, well, you know, follow these commands. You can do that. And the next thing we're going to find is what the, the claim of this ruler was. The ruler's like, great, <laughs> I've done that. In verse 21, all of these I've kept since I was a boy. In other words, he said, I've kept all the commandments, so, so I guess I have eternal life. You see, this, this guy thought he was good. He believed that he had been able to obey all the commandments of God. And that's really why Jesus responded to him in verse 19 like he did, because this young man needed to learn that, that no matter how good he thought he was, no one is good enough to inherit eternal life. So Jesus responds to him and gives him this command. He didn't correct him on his misguided belief that he'd been good enough. He didn't challenge him on his shallow understanding of what the law really is on these commands. 
Instead, he tells him this in verse 22. Okay, well, you've kept all these commands. There's one more thing that you need to do. Sell everything you have. And give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. Here, Jesus is, is masterfully responding and exposing this man's true idol, which was his wealth. He loved his riches. He enjoyed everything that money could buy, although he's got this spiritual vacuum in his life that caused him to ask the question about how he could inherit eternal life. Jesus knew that in order for him to inherit eternal life, he was going to have to set aside everything to follow him. Would this ruler be willing to get rid of the one thing that he loved in order to follow Jesus? Well, our series is on better decisions and fewer regrets. And boy, does this, this rich young ruler have a tough decision to make, doesn't he? Will he make the right decision? Or will he have many regrets? He obviously is concerned about having eternal life. You know, in, in one of the passages, it says he runs to Jesus and he falls on his knees and he asks, you know, what will it take for me to have eternal life? He really wanted it. You know, I'll be good, I'll, I'll work hard, I'll pay any price. Just tell me what it takes. And Jesus says, okay, if you want to know, here's what I'm going to need. Sell it all. Get rid of it. Give it to the poor. Then you can follow me. I'm, um, excuse me? <laughs> Did you say everything? What about you? I think every one of you wants to have eternal life, don't you? I think the reason you're here is maybe because you, you want to learn more and more about how you can, can secure eternal life. What is it that you would not be willing to give up in order to follow Jesus? Are you willing to give up your wealth, your influence, your position, your authority, a relationship? Drugs, career, fame, whatever it is, anything that stands between you and following Jesus, what is it that you'd be unwilling to give up? Is your response like the old meatloaf song? I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. Well, Jesus puts it before him. Here's what you need to do if you want to have eternal life. What was his decision? How did he respond? In verse 23, Luke tells us that when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. He was thinking, please, anything but that. You know, we never hear of this guy again. He might have lived out the rest of his days enjoying his wealth and then, uh, you know, not inheriting eternal life. Or maybe one day, sometime later, he finally made the right decision. We just never know. But what we do know about this rich young ruler is that he valued his wealth more than he valued eternal life. So he decided to choose wealth over Jesus, and he walked away very sad, and that decision ultimately leaves him with huge regrets. Sometimes our decisions in life show what we value the most. Many times we choose things in our life to be more important than our relationship to God. And like the rich young ruler, those decisions are going to lead to big regrets in our life. So as this man's walking away sad, having chose his wealth over eternal life, notice the comment that Jesus makes in verse 24. It says, Jesus looks at him and he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus knows how, how difficult it is to surrender everything, especially wealth, in order to follow him. And then Jesus goes on to make his famous comment in verse 25, where he says, Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, there have been all kinds of suggestions over the years by scholars about what did he mean by a camel going through the eye of a needle. And I remember hearing many times that they were talking about a specific gate in Jerusalem 
that at nighttime they would close the main gates and the only way to get into town was through this small gate that looked like the eye of a needle. And if someone was leading his camel that was loaded down with stuff, he wouldn't be able to get the camel through that gate, so they'd have to stop and, and load, unload everything off of the camel and bring the camel through first. Uh, so the point was, in order to enter heaven, we need to get rid of everything in our lives first that would keep us from entering heaven. And that's a great point. <laughs> the only problem was, there's no such gate like that in the city of Jerusalem, so the whole story is fabricated. Jesus was speaking literally when he spoke of a camel going through the eye of a needle. He was saying, it's impossible. But according to Jesus, it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it would be for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. And I think we can all empathize or sympathize with this rich young ruler, can't we? We're living in some pretty hard financial times right now. Inflation has led to recession. High gas prices have cost everything else to go through the roof. Our grocery prices are incredibly high. Our electricity bills are, are much higher. Housing prices and cost of rent have risen to all-time highs. And because of this hard time in life, we want to hold on to everything that we have with a kung fu grip, don't we? We're barely keeping our heads above water. It adds stress and anxiety to our lives. And we think, how am I going to be able to pay these bills? And then Jesus comes along and requires us to make a big decision. Do we value Jesus over our wealth? How are we going to answer that question? What decision are we going to make? Fortunately, unlike the rich young ruler, Jesus is not asking us to sell everything we have and give it to the poor. But he does ask us to give something. He asks us to give him a tithe. He says, just give me back 10% of the things that I've blessed you with. And yes, I know what you're thinking. You're, you're thinking I'm barely getting by with what I have. You know, in this recession, I'm, I'm actually having to borrow from Peter to pay Paul just to, to pay the bills. And then Jesus comes along and, and wants us to do this. How can I possibly give 10% when 100% is not making it right now. Well, I understand how you feel. I'm in the same boat. So all I can do is, is direct you to the promises of God in Scripture, where he asks us to make the decision to put him above our wealth. He promises that if we are faithful in giving to him, that he's going to meet our needs, and he's going to return what we give in abundance. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, he describes it like this, give and it will be given to you. Maybe you remember the song we, we sing in church a lot of times, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Maybe you break that verse down, it makes a lot of sense, a good measure. You know, I open my kitchen drawer and I pull out those four measuring cups that are held together with a little ring. I don't know why they do that. They get in the way of each other. But, but anyway, you've got the four measuring cups, and it's got little ones all the way up to the big ones. If you want a good measure, you use the big one, right? Maybe you could think back to the time of the country store where maybe they had a big barrel of candy, and you had that big metal scoop, and you, know, you got just as much as you possibly could. And that's the measure that God uses when he is giving back to you, according to this verse. It says, press down. Maybe you've loaded things into a box, and the box is full, but there's more stuff to put in it. So what do you do? You, you try to press the stuff down in there so you can get more in there. It says shaken together. Maybe you've got a jar that's filled with beans or something, and, and you shake it so it settles down so you can get some more in there. It says it's just running over until it's poured out into your lap. These are the words that express the way God gives back to us when we give to him, he says, for what measure you use is going to be measured back to you. You know, a lot of times I'll do weddings for, for family members or people in the church, and I don't charge them to do those things, and, and sometimes they'll give me a check anyway. And what I'll do is I'll take that check and put it in a wedding card and give it back to them. And what they finally realize is the size of their gift from me is going to be determined by what they gave to me. 
Because whatever they gave to me is what I'm giving back to them. The measure they use is how it's measured back to them. So let me ask you this question. And I want you to answer this question to yourself as honestly as you can. Do you believe the word of God to be true? I mean, do you really believe the word of God to be true? If you do, then the decision of whether you're going to value Jesus above your wealth is really a no-brainer. Because God's word to us is if you give to him, he's going to give back to you in abundance. And I know it's hard for you to loosen your grip and to give this a try. But God says, if you don't believe me, give it a try. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, he challenges. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. Test me in this. And see if I'm not going to throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there's not going to be enough room to store it. I want to encourage you this morning with everything that I have to make the best decision right now to trust God in this promise. If you will do that right now, I can promise you you'll never have any regrets in giving to him. Well, the people that Jesus was telling this story to that were watching as Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler, they knew this rich young ruler very well. They knew what kind of guy he was. He was a good guy. I mean, he kept the commandments. He, he was a, a, a well-known person. He was a ruler. People wished they could be that guy. So as they're seeing what happens there, it's understandable that they would ask in verse 26, well, if he can't be saved, then who can be saved? Clearly, they're shocked. And their question's understandable, especially when you realize that, that in that culture, wealth was a sign of God's blessing. People believed that people were rich because God blessed them that way. So when Jesus said it was easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, they're stunned. You know, surely no one then could be saved. So Jesus answered their question of who can be saved then in verse 27 when he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. It's one of the greatest answers of Jesus in the entire word of God. Here we must understand that salvation is clearly a work of God and not a work of man. That God saves sinners, we don't save ourselves. That we are incapable of obeying the commandments of God perfectly. No matter how hard we try, we're never going to be good enough to obey the commandments of God. And that's why we have to call on the mercy of God. But to receive that mercy, God is asking you to make a decision. Are you willing to give up everything in order to follow Him, who is eternal life Himself? Will you sacrifice everything in life for something better in eternity. In October of 1781, General Cornwallis marched his British troops into Yorktown. The Patriots to the south had wreaked havoc on his Redcoat Army, so he was hoping to rendezvous with the British Navy on Chesapeake Bay. American and French troops, however, anticipated his plan and they're pounding them with cannon fire, and the French fleet cut off the British fleet so they could not escape by sea. Thomas Nelson was then the governor of Virginia. He was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and he's fighting with the Patriots, firing cannons in Yorktown, gathering the men together. He points to this beautiful brick house up on the bluff, and he said, that is my house. It's the best one in town. And because of that, I know that General Cornwallis has almost certainly set up his British command in my house. So he told the American artillery, open fire on my home. They did. As the story goes, the very first shot was at Mr. Nelson's house. It went right through the large dining room window and landed on the dining room table where several British officers were eating. Now, it's one thing for a man to talk about freedom, but it's quite another to destroy his own house to make that freedom a reality, isn't it? 
Nelson understood, however, that to hold on to the current life meant forfeiting the life that he was so desperately seeking. A life of true freedom would cost him the stuff of his present life, but it was a small price to pay for what he was fighting for. On October 19th, the British troops surrendered. The Red Coat Band played the song, The World Turned Upside Down. What an apt song that was. An army that couldn't afford to put shoes on its soldiers' feet had defeated the world's greatest superpower. You see, you cannot defeat an army that's willing to sacrifice everything. They currently have something infinitely better waiting on the other side. And just like that, Jesus promises something infinitely better on the other side, doesn't he? To those who are willing to sacrifice everything they currently have. The rich young ruler was unwilling to do that. He would not part with his riches. And so he received something infinitely worse for an eternity. The truth is we all have something that we're holding on to, don't we? Something that we're not willing to let go of that is keeping us from enjoying the wonderful promises of God that he will give us if we'll put him first in our lives. Reminds me of the story of the balloon man. There is a, a man that for some reason had a handful of, of balloons, you know, 20, 30 balloons he carried with him everywhere he went. He'd walk through town and people, oh, there's a balloon man, we like that guy, he's always got balloons, he was, was famous for his balloons. And one day he got a card in the mail where he had won a free trip on a cruise boat. So this is going to be great. People on cruise boats love balloons. It's like a party out there. So he gets everything together, and he goes down to the cruise boat, and he gets out there on the deck, and, and as they push off the, the, the dock there, people are partying. There's balloons everywhere, confetti flying. Everybody's having a great time, and the balloon man was just in his heaven right there with everything going on. But after a little while, the, the, the horn sounded, and people started going into the dining room to have dinner, and he could smell the, the beautiful dinner that was coming out. And when as he walked over to go in there, he realized he couldn't get through that little door with his balloon. So That's all right. I'll, I saw some snacks out by the pool. I'll just have some snacks and sit by the pool. So he ate some snacks out there, and he was content. He's in, in a beautiful place holding his balloons. And, and as the night wore on, people started retiring to their cabins, and as they went to the cabins, they were finding out how wonderful these cabins were. They were decked out so nice and had all the best amenities. But the balloon man couldn't get through the door to get to his cabin. He said, that's all right. I saw some lounge chairs out by the pool. I'll just sleep on the lounge chair tonight. And he did. And this went on for several days. And he ate snacks and slept on the lounge chair. But all the while, he would hear the, the laughter and the, the clinking of the dishes in the dining room and and the people talking about how wonderful their cabins were. But he said, that's okay, I'm, I'm still having a good time with my balloon. And on the last day, someone put a piece of paper in his hand. It was an invitation. He was invited to be the, best, the guest of honor at the captain's table. And he thought, man, that would be wonderful. I would be honored to be with the captain. Everybody would look at me. I would be so popular. It would make me so proud. But there's no way I could go down there with my balloon. So that night as he heard the the hubbub of all the commotion, the people going down there and smelled the wonderful smells of the food and the music playing, he finally realized he had a decision to make. Is he going to hold on to the things that is keeping him from all these other wonderful things, or is he going to let it go and go enjoy all the things that he had been promised? So finger by finger, he lets it go. The balloons float away. And he walks down and he enjoys the best meal he ever ate, sitting next to the captain. Everybody was, was just making over him because he was the guest of the captain that night. Never would have happened if he didn't let go of the balloons he'd been holding on to. What is it that you are holding on to in your life that you've been refusing to let go that's keeping you from enjoying all the things that God says he has waiting for you? Whatever it is, you need to make the best decision that you've ever made in your life. Let those things go. And instead of living for an eternity with big regrets because you wanted to hold on to something rather than, than giving it all to Jesus, instead you could live forever in a place where there's no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and no more pain. Make the right decision today.
better decisions, fewer regrets. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we all have so many decisions to make every day. Some of them really don't make any difference in our lives, but Father, some of them change our lives forever. So Father, we just ask that you would help us to make those decisions based on putting you first in our life. So whatever it is, Father, that, that anyone that's in here today is holding on to that's keeping them from their walk with you, keeping them from the blessings and the eternity that you've promised them, Father, put it on their heart to begin opening their fingers and to, to let go whatever it is they've been gripping so tightly. Father, if there are people here that have never made the decision to accept you as their Savior, Father, we just pray that you would touch their hearts this morning that you would just give them a little nudge to, to make that decision today so that their eternity is promised, the blessings are abundant, and they live forever in the joy of the Master. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before our usher team comes forward to receive our tithes and offerings and response cards, here's a few important things happening with our CE family. Each week, I get the privilege of spending time leading kid experience. I love seeing the kids sing songs to Jesus as they're dancing around. Or hear them process what they've learned in small groups with a leader that cares about them. Yes, I also know as they learn the Bible stories and verses that these lessons are taught and the concepts, they will always stay with these kids yeah. throughout their life. Thank you to so many of you that bring your kids to KE each week and to those of you who serve on the KE team and for those of you who make this ministry financially possible. Investing in the next generation is the best. It really is. And as our KE kids say, KE is, KE is a place to be. We all need an inner circle of friends who keep us accountable for being spiritually healthy. One of the best ways to build great friendships with NCE is to join a life group or a serving team. There are many ways to get connected and we would love to help you find the best fit for you. To find out more, check the life groups or the serving teams bubble on the back of your response card and we will be in touch with you. Life is so much better together. As our ushers come forward to collect our response cards and receive our tithes and offerings, we all desire to make a difference and invest our lives and resources into causes that changes lives. Thank you for the impact that you have made through Next. Because of your generosity, we have been able to bless those in need, complete much needed building renovations, invest in the next generation, and help launch a new CE campus. And this is just the beginning. Thank you for being on mission with us to help more people experience a full life in Jesus Christ. Strong for us.
had the best time today, worshiping and learning with you. You may have made a commitment during the service and we'd love to have you reach out to us. If you have any questions, comments, prayer requests, go to churchexperience.com slash connect or scan the QR code on the screen. Want to get even more connected? Check out our CE social media, Instagram, Facebook, website, or app. Or go ahead and hit that subscribe button right here. What a great day it's been. Can't wait to see you next week.